morning. In this Patient Voice Initiative webinar, we're excited to share some research we partnered with Capri to do. The research undertaken in late 2022 had two key aims. One, to understand how Australian patient communities want to interact with biopharma, and two, to create a benchmark so that we could come back and see if these relationships are moving closer to those that our patient communities seek. We've shared some of this work in a few forums, but today Capri and PVI are releasing a report of that work. So it's a great chance for us to give an overview of the work and also see what we can do to ask about what next. So what is happening in response to this work and what still needs to happen? The format will be, I'm going to chat to our four panellists and then they're happy to take your questions too if you want to pop them in the box. So let me introduce our panellists. Today I'm joined by Patient Advocate and Patient Voice Initiative Chair, Jessica Bean. Jessica's experience is one of the, as one of the first cystic fibrosis patients to benefit from genetic modulation therapy gave her an intimate understanding um, of the emerging challenges faced by patients in the age of personalised medicine. This inspired a mission to ensure that patients and their values are represented in decision making across the health ecosystem. We also have the lead researcher from this work, PBI Advisory Committee member, Dr. Simon Pfeiffer. Simon's the Director of Research and Innovation at Capri. He's a pracademic, a practical academic with research focus directed at solving real world problems by studying human decision making using choice based measurement. In healthcare, this translates to measuring patient preferences and values. And we're also really pleased to welcome Gabrielle Batola. She's the Senior Manager, Corporate Affairs, Biopharmaceuticals at AstraZeneca. Gabrielle is responsible for patient advocacy, government and policy and communications across a wide range of chronic disease therapy areas. She has been in the pharma industry for over six years, working closely with a diverse range of patient communities to build capacity and networks and increase and deepen their role in decision-making across the life cycle of medicines and in health system policy reform. Gabrielle advocates for engagement to be centered on authentic, respectful collaboration. She's also a member of the Medicines Australia's Consumer Advocacy Working Group. And finally, we'll have Dr. Janelle Bowden. Um, Janelle's a scientist by training, and she has 20 plus years of experience working in and around clinical trial operations, both here in Australia and overseas for sponsors, sites, and as a consultant. Janelle has a real passion for creating more inclusive, accessible trials and supporting greater consumer participation and involvement in research. Her social enterprise, Access CR, provides clinical trial and consumer engagement services to the research sector to deliver on its mission to support, build capacity and connect and advocate for the needs of people looking for, taking part in and contributing to medical research and clinical trials. The Community and Consumer Research Workforce, or CCRU, as Janelle's group has become known. So welcome to all our speakers. Um, Jessica, can I begin by asking um, you a few questions? So today we're discussing this research that Patient Voice Initiative was pleased to partner with Capri um, into how patient communities in Australia want to interact with biopharma. Can you tell us broadly why you wanted to do this research? Thank you so much, Anne. And um, yeah, it's lovely to be back here um, being involved in, in webinars, although I feel a little bit rusty. Um, but we're, I'm really excited to uh, see this report and and to see the, uh, the product of this work because um, PVI has always been really focused on creating conversations and bringing stakeholders to the table. So. Uh, this is an extension of that work that we do, and we wanted to create a space for um, stakeholders, patient communities and industry to share the, that experience, those experiences in a really honest platform um, and, and document what those were so that we could have a better understanding of, of the experiences of each stakeholder group. I think the other piece of that is that this is Australian-based work, and although we see um, other pieces of work 
uh, happening in in this kind of context, there wasn't um, experiences that reflected the Australian patient communities particularly. So I think that was one thing that was really important to us. Um, and also that we wanted to make sure that in these conversations that we were having, we were reflecting various pieces of the patient communities, not just the big patient organizations, although we know their experiences are very, very important, but some of the voices that don't often get represented and, and particularly documented um, in this space. Well, thanks, Jessica. And what sort of specific issues were you seeing that you hoped that this research might address? I think um, one of the things that as an organization that we where we hear a lot of different conversations and we work with um, a number of the stakeholder groups was that there was often misunderstandings or um, frustrations that became barriers to working most effectively together. And so um, by capturing some of those um, frustrations, um, but also some of the things that are working really well, I think we would like to see um, it be a platform for um, creating more efficiency in how we work together. Um, I'm just going to mute. Yes, yeah, so I just, sorry, can I just ask everyone to mute their microphones and our apologies, we should have set that up for you on arrival so that you didn't have to mute yourself. But if you can look at your mic and hit the mute if you are. Sorry, Jessica, please go on. Not at all. I, I think it, it's about um, highlighting some of the conversations that um, we, we the patient community told us that. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, well, I think we all got muted then, Jessica. That was just a surprise. Okay, mute. Probably, once once again, go yeah. on. <laughs> Um, but about um, creating some transparency around some of those conversations and getting a better understanding of, of those experiences um, and also creating some benchmarks so that we can celebrate some of the things that are, are where we are seeing progress um, and continuing to, to work together in the most effective way. Oh, thanks, Jessica. And Simon, can I bring you in here now? Can you talk us through the methods Capri recommended and used for this research? I believe you used both focus groups and also a type of patient preference study, didn't you? We did, yes. Thanks, Anne. I'll just bring up a handful of slides just so I can talk people through it. Can everyone see those? Yeah, just so you know. Oh, perfect. Yep, so just want to touch on briefly the methods that Anne's mentioned, so I'll just talk you through briefly. So Anne mentioned qualitative focus groups. As with all good research, we start with talking with people. So we do do focus groups. They were conducted online with people representing the patient communities, and that was moderated by people from Capri and people from PVI. We also conducted some focus groups with industry to try and see, get this balanced perspective. So there are a number of groups with patient communities, number of groups with industry, to try and develop what are these key things we need to be talking about. So if we're looking at measuring satisfaction with engagement, what are the things that we need to measure? So the things that Jess was talking about, things that we thought might go into it, but we wanted to hear it directly from the people that are relevant, particularly the patient communities. So we took those key aspects, and we're calling them engagement aspects or domains, and took them into stage two, which was this quantitative survey, which I'll talk through in a moment. And now, or to the back end of last year and early this year, we have been talking about this research through workshops and obviously now looking to, to spread it more broadly. These are the particular engagement aspects or domains as, as sometimes they're referred to. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about them because that is all covered in the report and we do touch on a few of these later on. But um, for the purposes, if you do go to report, you'll see there's 11 of these particular areas of focus. And they did all come from that qualitative work that we did earlier on, um, ranging from feeling valued and respected all the way down to some things like early access and funding and, and other aspects that are important to patient communities in, in this relationship. The actual methods we used are preference-based methods, um, particularly called best worst scaling in this case. And we're asking people to choose from, choose from these extremes in this case, best and worst or most and least. The idea behind these particular methods is really to get around issues to do with scales. When people rate and rank things, um, they're not very accurate in terms of measurement because they don't give you a lot of information. For example, I might say eight, is this means important to me, and might say eight, 
uh, but they might mean different things. Um, so that's the trying to get things onto a common scale is why we move to this method called best worst scaling. In doing this particular measurement, we need to have two aspects. One is importance and the other is satisfaction. So on those 11 engagement aspects that we, we talked about earlier on, we looked to ask people about what was most important and least important out of those 11. We then moved to satisfaction. So we don't just wanna know what's important to you, we wanna work out how satisfied you are. So what's happening in this relationship? What's working, what's not working? In that particular component of the survey, we and then asked people if they would like to just talk about the industry as a whole, or they could actually name companies. So there were two different ways we can do it. The report will look at the industry as a whole. We have only given information out to specific companies as it was not the purposes of this research to benchmark companies, but really provide a engagement index for the industry as a whole. Brian, I think you're on mute. I am on mute. I'm obsessed with it today. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it's very in vogue. Um, so Simon, thank you for that. Where are interactions currently generally working well and, and what do those action interactions look like? Um, and I'll ask you my third question as well at the same time. And where is there a need to improve? Yeah, that's that's some great questions and that's really was the focus and the core principles behind this research and that's what we're going to look into and i'll just show you a couple of slides on this there is a lot of detailed information in the report so if you are interested um we will provide uh, details on how to access that and we'll certainly send that through to people who registered briefly touching on the demo because i won't spend too much time on this it's covered in the report but there were 74 participants um from patient communities are uh, representing di 52 different um, patient communities classified by various aspects that you can see here. As Jess said earlier on, we didn't just want to focus on the big patient communities, but also online communities and other representatives. So it was trying to be broader and more inclusive in that regard. The actual aim and general aspect was to develop this index. So we had satisfaction and importance on those 11 domains and we combined them together to form an index. You can see overall that it was around about 60 out of 100. So an index being out of 100, between 0 and 100, and 60. So there is still room for improvement. And we did want to benchmark and provide a measurement at this current time period. So what is the state of play in terms of satisfaction with this relationship? We then can look onto the right and look at the particular aspects, which I'll show you in a moment, about what's driving this index. Anne asked about what's working well. You can see there these various aspects that are working well. So we have things like patient knowledge, valued and respected, and some of these funding aspects. Those top two are really important. And I think, um, uh, you know, from an industry point of view, uh, uh, sort of a uh, kudos in terms of what they're doing, in terms of they do patient knowledge, they are focusing on patients, patients being, um, you know, custodians of their own information and, and feeling valued and respected. So I think those two going hand in hand, very important to see that they are high satisfaction and high importance, which is sitting on that top right. I've just looked at this quadrant plot, I didn't explain it, but it really has importance on one axis, satisfaction on the other. And we can just, this is one way you can visually compare the particular engagement aspects to see what, what is working well. And, and when we say working well, it will be things that are on the top right because they are higher satisfaction and high importance. Conversely, if we look at things that we need to work on, which was also part of what we were trying to do in this research, we definitely wanna focus on the positives, but we also wanna look at things that we can improve on. The idea being that we wanna come back and revisit this at another time period and see what have we done in the interim? So part of the work that PVI are doing and, and working with all the stakeholders is trying to look at if there are areas for improvement, what are they? What can we all do to work together? And if we come back in the back end of 2024, have things made a difference and have they changed? Some of those things that we're going to focus on are involvement in the product and treatment life cycle and early access, because they do sit relative to the others more on this high importance, low satisfaction side of the quadrant. So there are others and you can look at it, it's all relative to each other in terms of their positioning, but those two stand out as being areas that we do need to focus on. I won't go into this too much, but we did deep dive. So it's not just quantitative information that we can look at graphs and quadrant plots. We then had a lot of information where we prompted people for them, for individuals, why are we? Why is this not working for you? Why are you dissatisfied with this particular engagement aspect and what's happening with this interaction with Biopharma? People were able to give us a lot of detailed information. This is just an example that we had from one of our previous presentations, but all of this is in the report where qualitatively through open-ended text boxes, people were able to say, this is why. So this is an area that was important to me 
And what's been happening with my relationship with pharma, these are the reasons, these are the things I think we need to change. So asked about areas for dissatisfaction, areas for improvement, they're all reflected into themes and all backed up by quotes from the patient community directly who participated in this research. So very powerful information, uh, very rich in terms of its depth. Um, and it's certainly something that we can look to, to use as we move forward. Oh, thanks, Simon, for that. Um, there's a, a great um, range and depth in this um, report that's out today. Um, and as Simon said, this, this report will be um, on our websites, but we're also emailing it directly to everyone who's uh, signed up for this webinar. And um, also do just drop us a line if you're looking for it and you can't find it, we'll just email it to you directly. We've been talking a bit about, um, about the biopharma industry. So I'd love now to bring someone from that industry in, uh, Gabrielle. Um, a few questions for you, and I'm sure um, other people have further questions. So just to encourage everyone, pop your questions in the chat box and, and we will come to them. But can I start, Gabrielle, by asking you, you know, when we completed this research, uh, we met with the participants and we also met um, with industry individually to hear their thoughts about the results and discuss what we could do next. Can you tell us why this uh, research matters to industry and why some of this is challenging for Australian industry? Thanks, Anne, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um... This research matters because patient communities matter. Um, you know, I mean, industry, we are all about discovering and developing medicine so that we can make an impact on people's lives. And the patient communities are exactly those people that, you know, are the reason for our existence. So this research helps us be better um, in not only what we do, but how we do it. Um, and in the past, I mean, every company is a little bit different, but engagement has been based on the views or the practices of the communities or the groups that we had existing relationships with or groups that had the loudest voice that sort of shouted the loudest um, or it was just based on assumptions about what was important and valuable. So this research is important because it actually we're hearing directly from the people that we want to work with um, and of all the domains and prioritising the way that the research has been set up by what's important um, you know, the satisfaction and the importance. But it, having those different elements prioritised, it actually helps us as companies to focus and prioritise what's most important and what's of most value. Um, and what's really exciting about the research is that it's not a one-off, that, um, you know, the first phase of the research provides this baseline for us. And then as the research is repeated over time, we can see how things change. Um, and as industry, we can track how we are performing, um, both as a collective industry, but also as individual companies. So this helps keep us accountable, um, which is really good. Uh, the research also helps people. So within every company, there are people whose specific roles is to lead engagement with patient communities. So this research actually helps those people educate internally within industry and within companies so that companies can grow and improve their engagement practices and the policies that support them. Um, so this research is really the data that helps us bring about change. Um, and then onto really what's the challenges. I mean, we work, we operate in a heavily regulated industry. So yes, we admit there, there may be some challenges, but we have to do it. We have to be better at this. And good patient engagement is just too important to let the challenges um, be an excuse or to stop us. Uh, industry is made up of lots of different types of companies. Um, they've got different structures, different cultures, different appetites for risk, uh, different compliance processes and policies. Uh, and many companies are part of global organisations where policies and processes may be decided overseas. So an individual company's practices around patient engagement can sometimes depend on those varying factors. But I'd say in general, and I think, you know, as industry, we feel this way, companies genuinely believe that this is important and valuable. Um, and they're already implementing ways to improve engagement practices and policies, and they're investing resources to do that. Uh, the other reality is that companies, as I say, within industry are varied and they vary in range, in size and the range of disease areas or therapeutic areas that they work in. So for example, the research says that 
patients want to be engaged across the life cycle of a medicine. Or, and you know, particularly things like early access are really important. But a company may currently not work across all parts of the life cycle. They might not have early access programs or currently have clinical trials in Australia. So they actually may be unable to provide some of those things that patient communities are looking for. But then that's why it's so important that we, we build genuine relationships, that we can have open dialogue with these communities so that when there are challenges or just simple structural realities, we can communicate about them so that it's not that we're just ignoring them and pretending they're not there. We can actually be as open and honest as possible and have that dialogue um, so that when something, you know, a situation, something might not be achievable or something we embarked on doesn't quite, you know, go to plan, we can actually be frank with each other um, between industry and the patient communities and, and actually talk about it and learn from it. So that's why, um, you know, challenges shouldn't get in the way of actually proceeding and doing better. Oh, thanks, Gabrielle. There's a lot in what you said there for us to, you know, understand that diversity of industry. And I think that's something patient communities can relate to, you know, they're not one size fits all either and so that ability to have dialogue to unpack why things are the way they are mm -hmm. is, is really valuable now I understand that um, within um, one of the working groups in Medicines Australia you've been looking at this research um, can you tell me um, what that group's doing and and where you think you can make a difference thanks Anne um, it's really again it's about learning and we this, this report is an opportunity for industry to learn from patient communities. And then within industry, we are sharing best practice and learning from each other. So the Medicines Australia uh, Consumer Advocacy Working Group, which I'm part of, we've really taken this research on board. And the first action for us was to meet with Capri and PVI to really understand the research in detail and what it was actually telling us. And individual companies have also met with Capri to go through the individual company reports that were produced from the research. So that is helping individual companies in their own way. And in our working group, we recognise what's actually happening in that wider environment at the moment and how the research complements and actually ties into things that have already been completed or are, are happening now. And that's, for example, the National Medicines Policy, the Parliamentary Inquiry into Approval Processes, and of course, the HTA review, which is going on now. And I, I know many of the people on this call, practically all of you have been involved in those, or either all of them or some of them, and you know, consultation to the nth degree. Um, and many patient groups have also been um, part of the consultation led by the department's Consumer Evidence and Engagement Unit called Conversations for Change. And the Conversations for Change report was just um, published about two weeks ago. And interestingly, it has very similar findings to this research, in particular, the idea of engaging across the life cycle and, you know, earlier on clinical trials research and moving away from this focus only on the reimbursement process um, of, of the wider system. And the Conversations for Change report calls for improvements in engagement and participation at the early stages of research and clinical trials, but also at the later stage, um, after a medicine's been in use for some time, and how do patient communities actually give us that insight into how it's been used and what impact it's had within those, that area. And so the CEU embarked on that project um, to inform the development of the enhanced consumer engagement process. And that was a project that was outlined in the strategic agreement signed in 2021 between the medicines industry and the government. So MA, Medicines Australia and the government realised that this work um, really needs to be patient led. And so that's why the majority of people that are co-designing this process are actually gonna be patients and patient communities. Um, and so it really will be truly patient led. So there's all this reform work underway and what industry is doing is applying this Capri and PVI research to inform the way um, and really guide the way we formalize the role of patient communities. So that we can try to actually embed the things that we're learning through this research in the, the more formal um, work that is happening now. Um, 
And the research also allows us as an industry, but also as individual companies, to then go and have those conversations one-on-one -on -one with the patient communities that we already work with. So we're applying it in that where they're good conversation starters in many ways for us to actually talk to the patient communities that we do work with and actually have that conversation about how we want to work together and how best to do that. Oh, thanks, Gabrielle. And I think that point there you make, you know, almost about a, a systematic and, and um, you know, landscape-wide approach to um, this really resonates with us because, you know, that was, as Jessica alluded to, one of the reasons Patient Voice Initiative is very focused on patient engagement in health technology assessment. But we were interested in this question because the engagement that goes on there also has barriers that occur because of a lack of engagement earlier in the process mm -hmm. and then also important repercussions for that later engagement that you talk to there. Now, I want to bring in Janelle because we've been talking about earlier engagement and um, this immediately made us think about uh, Janelle Bowden's work. Janelle, knowing your work to improve consumer engagement in research and at conferences, I recall that we spoke to you about this research from the outset. Um, and I was interested to know, are our findings similar to what you are learning in the C-Crew community? So um, thanks, Anna. I'd like to congratulate Capra and, and um, PVI on doing this work and, and coming up with the domains because I think they're really useful for everybody to kind of benchmark. Um, and, and I think you've captured really well the things that, that matter. Um, just briefly for everyone, it was kind of mentioned in the introduction. When I just to contextualize my my answers, the people that I'm talking about, my community, the crew community, they're um, people that are looking for taking part in and contributing to research as, as patient partners um, uh, in all sorts of different ways. And so I connect with them through a Facebook group that I have. Um, uh, I, I have a crew newsletter that kind of shares the opportunities to get involved um, and shares resources to kind of to, to help um, lift the knowledge and, and opportunities for crew. Um, and I do a, a bit of community outreach, both within and external to health circles. So trying to, doing a lot of listening, essentially, um, around people's experience of research and, and what they know and what they'd like to do. And I think, in, in those circles, I'm not necessarily hearing a lot of discussion about working with pharma. Um, so just to provide that context, and I don't have any formal research like this, this study is, but it's a lot of listening and I guess pulling that information together. I would say that I do hear industry mention in the way that it impacts people's experience or their ability to engage and, and get involved in research. So what I would say is consistent between what I absorbed from crew and your findings is a frustration with a lack of involvement in, in research across the board from start to finish and, in the, and a lack of awareness um, and access to clinical trials. And that essentially means early access to products. So two very common areas that I think um, my community and, and your, com your survey results have kind of uncovered. Um, I also think that to the crew community, it's really important that they feel valued um, and respected um, in and in research, often the interaction is way too tokenistic. Um, I think patients and families want to know what's coming down the pipeline or available now. They want to make sure that what's being developed is going to address their needs. So that means researching and measuring the things that matter to them which really means you have to involve people from the start if you're going to get both the research question, the product right, and um, and what's measured to, to know whether that's having a meaningful impact on their life. Um, and if you don't involve them, they will make things happen for themselves. Uh, and there's lots of patient-led research. Um, and the activity and expertise of some of my Facebook group members about their health conditions, what's happening in research and industry, their global networks, it really does blow me away. And, and you know, they're far more expert in research than I am. 
Um, I would make one note that one of the things that did come up, I think, was that rules of engagement didn't didn't wasn't as important as some of the other things. But I think there is actually quite a deficit in knowledge around how patient groups can interact with pharma or what the potential barriers are for that, what the regulatory framework is that they sit in. Um, and I think we probably need to do a better job at explaining that, um, not so much as to um, accept the status quo necessarily, but to understand it and, and work together. Um, and I, I love Gabriella calling out really the need for having these courageous conversations so that we start to move in a common direction um, and a meaningful direction and learn together, not just in our silos, but um, together. So. Apologies. Um, thank you, uh, Janelle. Um, I think that's really interesting that you pick up on that rules of engagement, um, because I think that's one of the things we heard a lot of and was in our minds as we went into the research. I think it's still an important area, but maybe didn't come up quite as high as some other areas uh, in the research. Um, but we hear a lot about this product life cycle and earlier involvement. We've been talking about it again today. Um, so from your experience, what is key to consider and what might it look like? So in, in trying to kind of prepare and unpack this question, I thought it, I'd kind of create a product life cycle in a very simplified version. So I think, Anne, you're going to put that up for me. So that, uh, and, and this is a very simple version um, and I didn't realize it had uh, animation on it so you can flick through all of those if you like <laughs> sorry about that um, so I've re represented the product life cycle in a very simplified way here and it's a road rather than a circle because sometimes we go back to the start but sometimes um, that product development can go in a completely new direction so the road continues on and the journey continues on um, and it really starts with having an idea for a product or service underpinned by a need or a desire for that service. So in the context of what we're talking about today, that's really matching patient needs and experience with the science and industry capability to produce that product or service. So knowledge of each is critical for achieving good product market fit. So earlier involvement in that context, therefore, means making sure patients are at the table in those early discussions about what's needed and what's possible and trying to find a common ground to move forward. Then it's about designing and operationalizing that research. So there is a role for patients in both preclinical and clinical activities. But if we think about the clinical research space, how do we design protocols that patients will want to participate in that are understandable, inclusive, non-burdensome, respectful, and whose eligibility criteria reflect the final end user population, including the diversity of that population, and that measure the outcomes that matter to patients? How do we let people know about the research they can participate in and disseminate its outputs in ways that are understandable, relevant, and properly contextualized? How do we respect those participating? And in order to answer all these questions, we really have to consult widely, not just with one person, but with the community that that research is designed to help and to capture their experience along the way and learn from it. And I'm gonna come back to a couple of these points in a little bit more detail in a moment. Thirdly, how do we analyze the ongoing risk benefit of the product or service such that it continues to registration and funding? And outside of the commercial decisions that may impact whether or not a product or service continues towards being marketed, patients can critically input on whether the safety profile and other risks such as the potential cost are acceptable given their health circumstances in light of the benefits that are being observed. Then the next step is to figure out how do we get the product approved and funded. Um, ensuring we've collected the experiences and impact of use along the way through that research, all those research trials, is really going to make that collation of patient evidence to support all the other requirements of registration and funding bodies much easier. It'll save rework and additional delays in going back and collecting new data, which ultimately leads to earlier access. And finally, how else could the product or benefit be used or improved? 
that ongoing assessment of the risk benefit in light of new evidence or other innovations that may come along. That really requires an ongoing relationship and communication with patient communities, um, a partnership for the long term, rather than the transactional activities that usually occur in any one part of the product life cycle. So for me, earlier involvement um, underpins, underpins achieving better product market fit and better evidence for those approval and reimbursement processes that might even give regulators and HDA bodies more confidence to consider approving and funding earlier access. Um, I don't know if uh, the, there's a couple of factors I think that perhaps get in the way. I don't know if you want me to talk to those, Anne. Do, I'll give you a little more time because I think actually in those few minutes, you just gave us a great overview of some really clear points about, about what this area might look like. So I think there are really two things that play into us getting earlier involvement of patient experts and patient groups in the research phase in, in Australia, which is that really early part of that product life cycle. And the first is recognition is we have to recognise Australia is a small, often late market, and decision-making around research often happens at a global headquarters. And I don't think that this means that Australian patients can't be involved, but it does take some will from local operating companies to think about how Australia may provide input into what's those decisions that are happening at a global level whether that be by advocating for or facilitating Australian representatives on global patient steering committees or advisory boards, whether it's getting feedback locally when asked at the product or protocol feasibility stages um, from, fee from patient groups, just as, as they do for the key opinion leaders and clinical groups, or by establishing local patient advisory groups um, for a protocol once it's been awarded, in order to facilitate operationalizing it here. And that's everything from recruitment plans to ethics applications to advertising to monitoring the experience of the patients involved, the participants of that research, to contributing to communications before, during and after the trial um, and, and peer support. So I think there is a lot that we can still do, even though it's often these trials are globally, globally led. The second is um, to think about the regulatory environment. Um, and here's where I think the advertising legislation probably gets in the way. It permits companies to talk to healthcare practitioners, but not to health consumer organizations and expert patients. And while no one wants direct to patient advertising, um, I think that the landscape in general and the expectations of patients has really changed since that legislation was was put in place and it does create a potential barrier to patient experts and patient organizations being more actively involved across the product life cycle in a meaningful way with industry to deliver that earlier access to more patients. So whether it's defining a role for this group in communicating with industry or providing a more nuanced definition of advertising that excludes patient involvement in R&D activities, I'm not really sure. But while this legislation exists um, and these definitions exist, it does create barriers for um, the patient population in a number of those domains that you, you've identified, like the rules of engagement, like capacity building, like getting information on products, early access, access to research, access to products, um, early access schemes, and involvement in the product life cycle. And, you know, just one practical example of how this impacts, um, there's an inability, for example, for patient experts to participate fully in therapeutic area specific conferences that are part funded by biopharma sponsorship or trade halls, because there's this perception, this, this um, interpretation of advertising, which means they can't be fully making use of those opportunities. So, you know, there's lots that we can do. Um, and I think there's some couple of key, key areas that we could do more. 
Well, thanks, Janelle. Those two examples um, speak to a lot of the conversations we've been having in the community. I think our communities cross over and, and we heard some of that at um, HCAI Adelaide as well this year, you know, that thought about what could be changed here or how do patient communities connect to international work if, if, if we can't do that here. And um, and also that thing about um, really having the information to act in an empowered way and that difference in understanding about who patient communities really are now and, and what it is they want to do with this, this information and knowledge. So I really uh, value um, your, your comments there and people may want to jump into the panel and, and, and add some more questions. But I now can see that we've got some questions here that I'd like to put back to um, our panel. The first one is from Karen. Hi, Karen, nice to have you here today. I'm not gonna read the full question out because I'm hoping our panelists have seen it, but I think I'll um, direct the first one to Gabrielle. And th that question is, do you see any compliance issues being raised from Medicines Australia to patient um, authorship or open access publications of research sponsored by Medicines Australian members? I can read you the full question if you like, Gabrielle, but I think it's been sitting there for a little, so I'm hoping- I've seen, seen it. it. And I actually, right. a, a shout out and thanks to Petrina from Medicines Australia, who's actually replied um, and he's going to follow that up with the, um, the code team at Medicines Australia. But uh, I mean, I have seen um, representatives from patient communities actually being co-authors on papers and things. Um, so it, it happens. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, how that would come about. Um, I wasn't part of that project, but I, I do know it, it has happened. So, but interested to see what the, um, the code team actually say about that well thanks for that and it does pay to scroll down doesn't it thanks <laughs> Katrina great to have you here today as well another question from Karen I've got up there I'm just checking Katrina hasn't typed her answer yet so we might do this one on screen um, a question about diversity equity and inclusion in contrast to academic authors patient authors are mainly women and this same gender bias can be found with patient peer reviewers and in some case, patient advocacy groups, speaker panels, um, fewer manuals. In terms of diversity of consumer invol involvement, did you mention gender representation and what can be done in Australia to engage more men and non-binary representatives? Now, I realise we have lost Simon um, from, from this. I'm wondering, uh, Laurie, um, I think we've got Laurie Axford online or Bronwyn Underwood, whether you would like to, sorry, Bronwyn West, sorry, you're, um, whether you would like to come on and, oh, there's Laurie, great. Did you want to comment on that, Laurie? Um, thanks, Anne. Yes, so Simon had to duck away. Um, if I read the question correctly, um, then you, we do have this strong gender bias, but um, it's, it's it's driven by the um, by the the female gender having a greater level of interest in engagement. Um, it's fairly similar to the problem we have with males attending their GP that males don't necessarily want to go to the doctor, and they seem to be less wanting to engage in their own health and health generally. So I, I think it's a much bigger broader issue than than just a simple way to try and encourage them to participate. Um, I don't know whether anyone else has got any thoughts on that. Not sure much I'll help with the answer there, but, um, yeah, it's, I think it's... A, I, I, it's it's not something we specifically looked at, is it? But it is something, I guess, we observe, isn't it, Laurie? If none of the other... Janelle, did you want to make a comment? Um, it's interesting because we were having exactly this discussion on the preparation for another conference this morning, um, the fact that there is quite a strong um, representation of female orientated people um, uh, in the consumer work. Um, and whether that's due to time, interest, I think, Laurie, you make a great point. You know, it, it's probably disengagement with health in general. Um, and, and probably the roles that women take on in life. So, um, I think it is something that we need to address and it's about how do you get into men's spaces and talk about this stuff and these opportunities. Um, certainly, you know, there is lots of male representation in prostate cancer research um, for obvious reasons, 
women can't contribute in that unless they're carers of their, their husbands, but um, it's about providing, providing opportunity and also relevance to why they would want to be involved. It's Thanks, interesting. Sorry, it's interesting. Gabrielle. It's interesting. Um, someone who we all know, um, a paediatrician, um, actually was once just in conversation uh, talking about um, saying, well, when mothers bring their children to me and corrected, stopped and corrected himself and said, oh, parents, oh, no, actually, it is the mothers who bring them to me. So this idea, I think you're right, Laurie, about um, the role of women in health um, and that's obviously steeped in the history and the idea of, the, you know, it's the role and all these gender-specific roles. But I think there's it's much bigger than just the advocacy. I think it's um, it's part of their engagement with the health system more broadly. Thanks, Gabrielle. And I think it, it speaks to this, um, you know, these wider methods that we need to look at diversity, about diversity in who we employ, diversity who we include in research and, and diversity in who we, we consult with and build relationships with. Um, and it's it's a it's a constant challenge. I, I do reflect that when I began in this uh, space on the other side of the world, we actually um our our diversity problem was we really only had males who were white um, and so it's in some locations it, we're having sort of different people involved in advocacy but that is a long time ago and I suspect it has changed. I want to jump in and ask the panellists I think what might be um, our last question for the day but I will keep an eye on that box. I must just say Warren we haven't got anyone here from um, the Consumer Evidence and Engagement Unit from Department of Health as far as I know today so we don't have anything uh, to report on um, on that question that you raised but it is something um, that access to information about the applications that are in front of PVAC so that consumers can make informed comment um, is, a, is a, a, a real priority for many in the community. Um, so that's why I haven't answered that question today. We just haven't got someone here to speak to that. Um, but what I would like to know, talking to our speakers, um, and maybe Jessica, I'll start off with you on this one, is so So, what do you want to see happen next? You know, where is it that we should act next? Yeah, thank you, Anna, and what a great discussion today. Um, I really liked uh, when Gabrielle mentioned that oh, this work is about reducing assumptions, and I think that that's the, a really key part of this. I think um, getting everybody represented and having those brave conversations um, about priorities really gives us a roadmap um, to work towards greater efficiency um, and, and be able to really prioritize um, the important parts of working together. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that this is um, a piece of work that can both uh, allow us to celebrate how far we are or how far we have come so far, but to really um, be, a, be a benchmark for continuing to work together in a more efficient way and in a way that takes into consideration that um, the landscape and particularly patient communities um, has changed and has evolved and, and how we can work together in the, a way that, that reflects that. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Gabrielle, can I bring you in here? Sure. Um, and I'm just reminded, Anne, that a couple of years ago, I actually asked Anne um, if there was any research done on actually asking patient communities what they wanted from pharma, because I was thinking about it myself in my job. And she said, just hold that hold that thought. It, it's coming. It's coming. So realising this this report is is so wonderful. Um, and I think for industry, what we want to see is that these insights are starting to actually influence decision making and prioritisation, both within individual companies and the way they prioritise the engagement, but also then across the industry as a whole, and then across the health system more broadly. Um, and with the HTA review happening, the enhanced consumer engagement process underway, there's potentially a lot of change coming. I mean, no pressure, Anne, um, but, you know, we're hoping that there, there really is going to be some wholesale changes. Um, and so we really need to make sure that the learnings from this research are realised and formalised and embedded in those, those reforms as we as we design them. Um, 
and really what's next in the longer term, we need to keep doing this type of research um, because we need to keep learning and we need to keep improving. Thanks, Gabrielle. Great points. Janelle, your thoughts there. And just to warn you, Laurie, I'm going to bring you in on this one as well. <laughs> um, you know, ultimately, it's the acceptance and integration of people with lived health experience, experts, the advocates and their patient organisations and recognising them as a valuable, knowledgeable stakeholder group in the ecosystem. Um, that it's not just nice to have, it's not a nice story that makes us feel good about what we do, that on a practical level, it means probably reviewing where health and research and therapeutic development policies and legislation may not be fit for purpose in enabling patient experts and organisations and industry to partner effectively across the life cycle. And for, um, you know, for getting patients access to the information, products and services they need in a timely and equitable fashion to help improve and save their lives. So I, I think we need to do, I think we know what needs to happen, but I think we actually need to start looking at those policies and legislation that could be standing in the way of doing this meaningfully. Oh, thanks, Janelle. Um, and look, I'm just gonna grab something off my shelf here because I was thinking of it while we were speaking. You know, um, I had heard, as you probably had heard for a long time, you hear sort of anecdotes about this earlier involvement and what might happen. And I just went, oh, it's not going to, will it come up? Yes, there it is. Um, if, you, if you're if you interested in this and you haven't read anything on it, there is this great book that is free. It was produced by the Council for International Organisation of Medical Sciences. And it talks about the earlier involvement, but it's full of examples of the difference it made, for example, when people went to the FDA or for regulation. And, and it's a really, you know, it's a quick evening read, but um, it's actually full of real examples about some of that earlier involvement that we were talking about today. And it's free, so you know I'm not getting commission for just showing that there, but um, you can go on, I can send you the link so you can download it for free. Laurie, I wanted to come to you as well. I know um, Simon's had to run off, but but you as well as Ellie Morris and, and the team at um, Capri have been so involved with this work. You know, it was very much um, the partnership in this research really came with you saying, look, I have a bit of an idea of something we can do here um, because you had seen issues in this area as well as you work between different companies. We hope to do this research again late 2024, and so we'll be able to do our first measurement of benchmark, but what would else would you like to see happen next? Oh, I've got you on mute there. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I think I think this, uh, it's, it's part of a whole structure that people are talking about how we can improve the patient voice Overall, um, and obviously we all hope there's going to be some changes at a at a high level for that. Um, from the, the research perspective, I think it's um, it's important to probably look. The focus of some of the things you've seen is on what's not working. Simon did show what's working as well, but a lot of the quotes are, are built around you know um, uh, yeah criticisms of the process or you know suggestions of how we could improve. I think it's important to look at the other end as well. So um, one of the tasks of PBI will be to dig a little bit deeper and Capri helping with dig a little bit deeper into what's working and set that as a, um, a, a benchmark of what some companies are doing very well for the others who may not be doing quite as well in those areas. So I think it's looking at what's working and how more companies can, can enhance on that and then obviously what's not working and how improvement can be made in that area before we... Uh, before we move forward. And, and obviously um, the research is not a means in itself. It's only going to show what's changed and hopefully we see a lot of positive change. It's how we act on the findings of that research and, and a number of other research uh, pieces that have been referred to today and how we, how we will work together to try and improve the system. Oh, thanks, Laurie. I think you raised a really useful point there too about, you know, one of the things that I've been really encouraged by is the really re positive response we've had from industry. You know, we began by talking to um, the sponsors of Patient Voice Initiative. 
but but a, a generosity too in 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 being happy to share examples of where um they're working that's being well received and and really just um you know lifting all the boats as they say uh with this work I'm going to end there because I don't think I have any further um, questions. Um, and thank you, Una, for your comment there. I'm hoping that someone will shout out to me if I've, if I've missed a question there. Otherwise, I would just like to do, say some thank yous before we wrap up today. Firstly, I'd like to thank our sponsors. You can see on this slide our in-kind sponsors as well as our gold sponsors at Patient Voice Initiative. We're really appreciative of their ongoing sponsorship, as well as our silver sponsors um, today as shown there. I'd just like to remind you that we're going to email the reports to you directly, but they will also be on our websites. But if you can't find them, sing out to us and let them know. I want to just give you a heads up um, that for those of you who did get to attend HTAI uh, 2023 Adelaide, and I can see some of the names um, on the screen there, Tomorrow morning, we'll be releasing um, one of the videos. So if you're involved in those videos, um, uh, stay tuned to Facebook and LinkedIn tomorrow morning. We're really pleased to release the first video out of that. And we have some follow-up actions coming from that. Can I thank our speakers, Gabrielle, Jessica, Janelle, Simon, now Laurie. <laughs> really appreciate you stepping in there. And I just also want to thank all the team at Capri who worked incredibly hard on this work um, and gave uh, their time to it. I want to do a special call out to Ellie Morris, who, who um, went, you know, learned so much with us on this and we learned so much from during this process. Um, we're really proud of the domains that we've um, arrived at or the aspects that you'll see in the report. Um, they were a lot of work, a lot of patients contributing to those and then trying to bring them together. And Ellie played a really critical role in working with us on that. So I'm really grateful to her. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us. And thank you again to all the people who participated in it. I'd just like it to make it really clear that all patients were offered reimbursement for their participation because that's the right way to involve people in research. So many thanks for your time today. If you missed any of this, we will make the recording available because we understand also that there was a problem with the link earlier. So thank you all and we'll see you next time.